am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And one of the greatest of these terrors is loneliness. In my wanderings, I have seen the lonely people of the Earth. I have seen their drawn and haunted faces in a city of teeming millions. And I have seen them, too, in places that have been long deserted and forgotten. Gull Point Lighthouse was abandoned many years ago. But today, a woman lives here all alone. She never leaves her forlorn and isolated home. Hers is a strange story, for she loved the bustling cities, the gay crowds, the laughter of pleasant company. Why, then, has she shut herself away in this desolation where no one ever comes to visit her? Hers is a story of loneliness and greed. It began years ago in a big city when the great industrialist John Sinclair was rising from obscurity. Sinclair was the foremost of these. The Gibson Motor Car Company was a pioneer in its field, a conservative company with limited production, until John Sinclair bought the company and adopted the slogan, a car within every man's reach. The year 1929 brought the greatest financial disaster in history. Millions were swept away in the stock market crash. Throughout the country, hundreds of banks closed their doors. But the House of Sinclair never failed to meet its obligations. Not a single depositor lost any of his savings. And John Sinclair paid 4% interest on every dollar invested with him. By 1931, John Sinclair's qualities of leadership, initiative, and enterprise won recognition from the youth of America, and he was awarded an honorary life membership in the Boy Scouts of America. And here, drawing to its conclusion, we see the famous trial of Sinclair and Associates against the Turner Company for infringement of patents. I thought it was an excellent tribute. Wake up. Show's over. How did you like the picture, John? Satisfactory. We thought it'd be a good idea if you said a few words tonight when we show it at the banquet. Stalins of uh, Public Relations has written a speech for you. I won't be at the banquet. But you're the guest of honor. It's our testimonial to you. After all, we're celebrating the court decision whereby Turner and company have to pay us 22 million for infringement of the Sinclair patent. I see no cause for celebration. I knew how to turn out, planned the whole thing. You handled the case very well, Paul. Thanks. I had to win or you'd have fired me. Probably. Very likely would. We do wish you'd come to the bank, but John? Yes, it's a special occasion. Yeah, you can celebrate for me. In the future, I want one thing clearly understood. From now on, I want nothing, absolutely nothing, to interfere with my personal life. What personal life? Suspicion and distrust in his fellow man have driven John Sinclair to solitude. There has been no time for love or companionship in his ruthless drive for power and riches. Even over his chess game, he cannot relax. 
for it is through the medium of these ivory pawns that he plans the strategy to expand his enormous holdings. But without realizing it, he has already strained body and mind beyond endurance. I've been telling him for a long time to take it easy. Now he's gone the limit. Another of these attacks may be fatal. I want him to go away for a long rest. Forget about business and loaf. He should go where he can't be reached by telephone. A boat trip on the Great Lakes would be excellent. I'll see that he goes. Remember, no last day to clean up the work at the office. I want him to leave town in the morning. All right, Don. <clears throat> I'll see you to your car. Thank you. I know Sinclair isn't married. Has he any close relatives? So far as I know, he hasn't a relative in the world. Well, he shouldn't go away alone. Why not? Well, another of these attacks may be the last. That's why somebody should go with him, a friend, if he has no relatives. There isn't anyone in the world he could call a friend. It's too bad. Well, good night. Good night. Telegram, Mr. Sinclair. I won't accept it. It's for you, sir. I don't care. I won't take it. I'm on a vacation. Last call for dinner? Well, what shall I do with it, sir? Do anything you want with it. Tear it up. I won't be bothered with business. Tell that dining car steward I want my dinner served in the room. Very well, sir. And another thing. I'm not to be disturbed. We get to Chicago. Very well, sir. We're coming into Chicago, sir. Mr. St. Clair? Mr. St. Clair, are you sick, sir? Oh, I'm all right. Is it Chicago? Yes, sir, and you've got to get across town to catch your boat. Don't worry about your baggage. The transfer company will take care of that. had these attacks before. Just as you say, Governor. Where shall I drop you? Doc 23, I'm taking the steamer to Duluth. Right you are, Governor. Ah! Here, here. Take it easy. You're with friends. You became unconscious like before we ever reached the dock, so I brought you up here. This room's right next to the one I live in. How long have we been like this? All day. It's eight o'clock now. I must have been a lot of bother. No bother at all, Governor. Glad to do it. I knew you was alone. I'm used to being alone. <laughs> yes. I know. I was in the same boat once. You try and get some sleep. I'll sit by in case you want anything.
So you're John Carter of New York. And you're Ernie Sparrow. Lightweight champion of England, 1919 to 1925. Yes, I've had my moment of glory, as you might say. Louis, how's tricks? Fine, Ernie, fine. You know, they still talk about you in the athletic club. It was a long moment, too. Morning, Miss Smith. Morning, Mr. Farrell. I had all the money I wanted. Box before the king and queen. I had the old of England in the palm of my glove. Did you do? How's the baby? She's fine, Hoyne. Yet, uh, something was missing, huh? Yes, there was. Catch? You were lonely. How did you know? You know, you said that you were like me. You didn't trust anyone. Oh. I was always training hard. Never had time to make many friends then. Always liked people, but never got to know them. It was always hello and goodbye. Hello, Sparrow. How are you, Tony? How's the wife and kids? And how's the business? Everything fine. Good. For you. Thanks. That's for driving the wife and kids to church. That was nothing. I was on my way home. One for your friend. Thank you. And one for me, too. Eat it. It won't hurt you. Bye, Johnny. Come on back sooner. I will. I see what you mean about making friends. What was I saying? Uh, oh, yes. Then when I got the title, it was worse than ever. I had time to make friends then, but I never knew who my friends really were. People always slapped me on the back. How are you, Sparrow? Have a drink, Sparrow. That was it, Governor. I had too many drinks. Good morning, Ernie. Hello, Mike. I brought home a sack of charcoal for you last night. It's down at my place when you need it. Thank you. Much obliged, Ernie. You were saying something? I was saying so. You ran away from it all, huh? You're right there again, Governor. Hi, Al. Hi, Sparrow. How's business? Fine. But I'm not sorry. I'm happy here in this country. Here I'm just plain Ernie Sparrow. And I have real friends for the first time in my life. Here's one of them now. Violets. Violets. Quiet, Violet. Edmund. Hi, <laughs> Sparrow. Mr. Carter, this is Amalok Ferdinand. He used to be a wrestler and a very good one. Now he's doing what he wants to do, growing his own flowers. Glad to know you, Mr. Carter. Remember Ferdinand the Bull? He liked to smell flowers, too. I'll take that sprig of violets. Handle them gently, nice Sparrow. Don't crush them. Remember, they're delicate things. Right, old Ferdinand. Goodbye. Bye. So tell me, Sparrow, how does a person go about making friends? You don't. People make friends with you, if you give them off a chance. Well, here we are. A clinic. If anybody in the world can help you, they can. Last time I was sick, I was given up for lost, but somehow they pulled me through. Well, I'm sorry, Sparrow, but I... If you're going to trust people, Mr. Carter, you better start right now. We all have to learn to do that sooner or later. I did. Go on in. Uh, wait a minute. Yes? Do me a favor, will you? Uh, these violets. There's a pretty young girl in there. Her name is Miss Joan Martin. Give them to her, will you? Goodbye, choo choo. Pretty for you, girl. No. Can I be your girl? My name is Bobby. Everyone says that's a boy's name, but it isn't. What's your name? 
charm. Well, this is a nice state of affairs. The minute I turn my back, you're untrue to me. All you women are alike. I can't help it if I'm popular. <laughs> they certainly learn young nowadays, don't they? Well, beautiful, if your gentleman friend doesn't mind, I must borrow you for a moment. Goodbye. Bye. Hello, Bobby. How's our favorite patient? Just fine, thanks. Don't be nice to her, Joan. She's been two-timing me. <laughs> no, I haven't. <laughs> Will you come in, please? Just wait in here, please. Good morning. Your name, please? John Carter. Oh, I was told to take very good care of you. You're a very privileged man. I don't understand. You happen to have pulled with a certain young lady by the name of Bobby. Oh. Is your name by any chance Miss Joan Martin? Why, yes. These are for you. Oh, well, this is sort of sudden, isn't it? What will Bobby think? Why, you don't understand. Sparrow asked me to give you those. Oh, isn't that nice? How thoughtful of Sparrow. He's always doing things for other people. You've no idea how he makes friends. You be sure to thank him for me when you see him, will you? I certainly will. Did you wish to see Dr. Rose, Mr. Carter? I hoped I might. Let's see. Uh, name, John Carter. Address? Uh, 238 Gordon Street. Okay. No wife, no family, no relatives. And should I add, uh, no friends? Have you finished your examination? There's more to an examination than a physical checkup and a few tests. If I'm going to help you, you must be perfectly honest with me. Well, it's no use, really. I, I've been to too many doctors. I'm sorry if I've wasted any of your time. Well, of course, we can't afford to waste any time here. There are too many people who really need us. And we don't care who the patient is or where he comes from, but we do expect him to help us. Think it over. My office is open to anyone at any time. All finished? Oh, yes. Yes, thanks very much. Well, goodbye, Miss Martin. Well, when are you coming back? I don't know. There you are. You don't often see a man of his type. I wonder what his story is. Hello. Why, hello, Sparrow. How's Florence Nightingale? It was sweet of you to send those flowers. By the way, how's your friend, Mr. Carter? I want to talk about him. Why hasn't he come back to the clinic? I'm sure Dr. Rose could help him. So am I. You know, I think he'd come back if you was to ask him. Me? Why, Sparrow, I've only seen him once. But you made a rare impression on him. He's staying at my place. Would you ask him as a favor to me? All right. <laughs> Someone to see you, John. Well, this is a pleasant surprise. Mr. Carter, I, I hope you won't think it presuming of me, but I wondered why you didn't come back to the clinic. Well, whatever the reason, it is nice of you to come. Uh, wh why should you concern yourself about me? I, I don't know. Dr. O send you? Oh, no. I know it may sound very strange to you, but... Well, when you didn't come back, I began to worry about you. You worried about me, a total stranger? Some people are never strangers, Mr. Carter. Won't you come back to the clinic and see Dr. Rose again? I know he can help you, if you'll only let him. Will you? Mm hmm I have the laboratory reports, Mr. Carter. They are not favorable. Well, I didn't expect they would be. Well, of course, I only know what your body tells me. But there are things about a man that the body has nothing to do with. What you're trying to say is if there's any help for me, 
It hasn't anything to do with medical science. Well, uh, something like that. Well, I was planning a trip on the Great Lakes. Well, that's the worst thing you could possibly do. Why? For a man without friends, there are few places so lonely as a crowded steamship. You'll find the seacoast much more relaxing than the Midwest. Well, go up to the coast of Maine somewhere. Get good sea air into your lungs and wholesome thoughts into your mind. Get a job. And above everything, try to make friends. And never forget, Mr. Carter, that loneliness is a disease that can destroy a man's mind. Could a man's mind give way from lack of companionship? Could a man actually die for want of a friend? You are the answer to your own questions, Mr. Carter. Well, goodbye, Dr. Rose. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter. What's the matter? Nothing. I know. I feel sorry for him, too. But for your own peace of mind, Joan, you can't allow yourself to become interested in the patient's troubles. I guess I'll never get used to working around here. Is he for a minute, dear? No. I want to talk about us. Of course, Fred. You know, between the night work here and my lectures with Dr. Farnham, we hardly see each other except when we're working. You're right. I'm really the world's most neglected fiancé. <clears throat> but you're the one who wanted to wait. You didn't want to get married until I'd established my own practice. And you agreed with me? I've changed my mind. I think we should get married right away. No. After all, darling, it'll only be another six months until you've finished your work with Dr. Farnham. Then... Then I still won't have enough money to start on my own anyway. Oh, come on, Joan. Say you'll settle for a weekend honeymoon. I can't, Fred. I want a home and security. I want our children to see the sun without having to go to a public park. And I want you to come home from your office with pride, not tortured and frightened by debt. You don't show much faith in me. Oh, I do have faith in you, darling. Everything in me wants to say yes. But I won't chain your life and mine to an environment like this. I wish I could believe you're right. I am. <laughs> <laughs> What you gonna do? I was asking what you gonna do. I'm gonna take Dr. Rose's advice. I know you can get a refund on your boat ticket, but will that leave you with enough to go to Maine? Look here, this is no time for silly pride. I've got enough put by to tide you over for a while. We'll go to the bank first thing in the morning and you can be on your way. You hardly know me. It ain't time that makes a man trustworthy. I'm betting on you all the way. Well, this is the first time in my life that anything like this has ever happened to me. I don't know what to say. Just say yes, and we don't need to say no more about it. But I don't need money. I have more than enough. Oh, I don't understand. Sparrow, I found something here that money can't buy. Something that I didn't know existed. Come to think of it, a six months vacation wouldn't do you any harm. Why don't you put that cab of yours in storage and come along as my guest? I couldn't think of it. Well... If you put it that way, I can't refuse. <laughs> it's a deal. Fine. <laughs> Let's go. Right. Hello, Joan. Good evening. Hello. Is Fred working again tonight? I'm afraid I was rude this afternoon. Oh, I understood. <laughs> I'm putting the old bus's stories tomorrow. Mr. Carton means off to Maine for health and happiness. I see you're finished with your dinner. Why don't you join us for a last spin in the park? Wish you would. I'd love to. Okay, let's go. There were times when we didn't have enough food in the house or money for medicine when I was a child. Maybe that's the reason I went to work for Dr. Rose. You intend to devote your entire life to working with these people? No. So long as I work, I'll remain with them. But when I get married, I intend to leave it forever. Oh, it's not that my husband has to be rich, but he can't be poor either. I don't want my children to have the childhood like I did, or the youngsters in the clinic. Well, it's very understandable. 
Of course, you do get away on your vacation. You don't take vacations when you work for Dr. Rose. You sure need one, Joan. Why don't you come along with me and Mr. Carter? I guess our housekeeping could stand a feminine touch. Fred would love that. Is Fred the young man who doesn't have to be rich but doesn't dare to be poor? Oh, I'm sorry. He's going to be a great specialist one these days. You mark my words. He's studying with the lung specialist, Dr. Farnham, all the evenings he can get away from the clinic. How long have you been engaged? Four years. Sparrow, it's been a lovely drive, but I think we should go home now. Right you all, Joan. Have you packed yet? Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to pack. Yes, sir. And another thing, let's get started on a man-to-man -man basis. No more of that sir stuff, huh? Right-o, Governor. So have you stored your car yet? Not yet. I'll be getting to the station if I put the old bus away. Well, we could take a cab. There ain't no profit in that. <laughs> well, you get rid of that hack of yours. I'll take care of the tickets. Yes, sir. I mean, uh, Governor. Oh, hello, Mr. Carter. Hello, Ferdinand. Uh, flowers today, sir? Yes. Well, we have some roses, asters. These two I can't pronounce. Carnations. I'll take all of them. Violets. All of them? Yes, all of them. You just going into business? No, I want some flowers, a lot of flowers. I want to impress a girl. Oh, some impress. Well, these are two and a half. I'll give them for two bucks. A dollar and a quarter, that's a dollar. These I'll throw in. Dollar seventy-five, eighty cents. Uh, thirty-seven fifty. Delivered. Delivered. You take this in. I'll take yours. Come on. This is the place. What now? You wait right here. Georgie, I don't know when I've seen such nice, fresh flowers. Yes, very pretty. Uh, how much are your carnations? Two dollars a dozen. Well, that's outrageous. Did you ever hear of such a thing, Georgie? Well, if you got this within reason. Marigolds, two bits a bunch. I don't like marigolds. They smell up the whole house. So do roses. It's all a matter of money. If you got four dollars and you want to smell up the house, you buy roses. If you got two bits, buy marigolds. How much are your violets? 20 cents a bunch, three for a half. Well, that's more like it. Wrap them up. They're not for sale. Didn't you just say there were three bunches for 50 cents? That's right, but only when they're for sale. Georgie, this man is trying to make a fool out of me. That's a wonderful idea. Yes, it's certainly... What did you say? Hmm? Oh, the very idea of you signing in with an insulting me. Oh, never say that to me again. Don't you? It certainly was nice of you to drop by and say goodbye. Well, I want to bring you a few flowers before I leave. Oh, oh. oh. Hello, Ferdinand. Hello, John. Look, Mr. Carter bought them all. <laughs> uh, Ferdinand, maybe you better take them in the clinic. Yeah, maybe I better. <laughs> that was an awfully nice thing for you to do. Will you have lunch with me now? Well, I don't have very long. Oh, we'll just go down the street. All right. You know, there's so much I have to say to you, and so little time in which to say it that I hardly know where to begin. Will there be anything else? No, that's all, thank you. What's bothering you? Sparrow said something last night jokingly, and I've been thinking about it ever since. What was that? About you coming along with us. Oh, you can't be serious. I am. Of course, I realize that we have only the most casual interest in each other. So I'll put my proposal on a business basis. Proposal? Yes. I'm asking you to marry me. What? But I'm not in love with you. Oh, I know that. When two people go into a business deal, there has to be something in it for each one. Now, what you have to offer is my chance to live a lifetime within a few months. In return for those few months, you'll be able to have everything you ever wanted. Does the name Sinclair mean anything to you? Sinclair? John Sinclair? Yes. I took the name of Carter because I'm sick and tired of the dishonesty surrounding Sinclair. I want to be another man for the time being. Any man. Oh, I see. Oh, you don't have to decide now. Think it over. Carefully. And remember, 
my entire fortune for a few months of your life. You're late. Sorry, I was held up at the last moment. Did you get it? Easy, dear. What's all this mystery about Carter being John Sinclair? You certainly were excited over the phone. Now, suppose you tell me what it's all about. I will. I will in just a minute. You know it's not right going through the files and taking out cards. Are you sure this report's correct? I don't know why you're so worried about it. Answer my question. Yes, I'm positive it's correct. I made that report myself, and Dr. Rose agreed with it. Look, darling, let's find a bench and talk about ourselves, huh? Come on. Oh, it's good. Good to have a night off. I hardly ever see you anymore except at the clinic. Well, it can last forever. Just a little while longer and I'll be able to have my own practice. <laughs> Business will probably be so bad you'll complain about my being around the house too much. Oh, Fred, I do love you. You must believe me. Oh, Fred. It's so wrong living the kind of life we have to live. Struggling. Never being able to have the things people should have. You've been very patient to stick it out. But you won't be sorry. Just wait and see. Fred, I'm going to marry John Sinclair tomorrow. What did you say? Oh, I know it sounds ridiculous, but it's our chance to get everything we've ever wished for. You mean you've wished for? It's just an arrangement for a short time. He knows he's going to die. Oh, Fred, try to understand. It's for us. It's not wrong. Tell me it's not wrong. Tell you what? You say you're in love with me, and yet you could even think of doing something like that? I do love you. Well, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> you're so much in love with me that you can't wait to marry somebody else. Oh, don't lie, Joan. Why don't you tell the truth? You never even thought of me. You're doing it because you're selfish. Because you're not satisfied to wait and work hard like any normal, decent woman would do. No. I don't think you're being dishonest. I think you're rotten. Why shouldn't I have my chance? For four years now, I've waited for you. Do you think it's been fun being alone night after night? Being in love with someone you never see? I'm human. Oh, Fred, I do love you. I always will. I've given you the chance to get ahead, and you failed. Now I'm going to do it my way. I waited for you because I believed in you. But you're soft. You've been afraid. You're always letting other people push you down. Oh, Fred. Try to understand. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for everything. Mrs. Sinclair. Fred. Fred. John Sinclair converted this abandoned lighthouse into a beach home. Here he learned to relax. The simple, wholesome life and Joan's care brought an astonishing change in him. But as the months passed, a strange bargain between Sinclair and his wife took an ironic twist. You're a real outdoor man now. You can do a day's work with the best of them. Ain't this the life? Yeah, this is the life. There's something bothering me, Sparrow. I'd like your advice. Right, Captain. I think I know what you're going to say. Yeah? You're not the first bloke what's fallen in love with his nurse, right? Right. I am in love with John. That's what comes from getting your health back. Have you mentioned the matter to the lady yet? Well, that's rather difficult. You see, our marriage is based entirely on a business proposition. What you going to do? Eat your all out in silence? Well, I don't know. The trouble is, I've always had my own way about everything, except... The most important thing, Governor. I'd have talked to her long ago if I was in your place. Have it out with her tonight. What shall I say? First of all, I'd apologize to her for being alive. You were supposed to die in six months, remember? That was part of your marriage contract. So don't you owe her an apology for breaking your agreement. I tell her it was her fault for taking such good care. 
Maybe you got something there. Hello, John. How's the water? Don't you think it's dangerous swimming out so far? I'm perfectly able to take care of myself, John. Won't you change your mind and come with us tomorrow? You know I don't like boat trips. Well, wait just a minute and I'll walk up the house with you. No, thank you. It's chilly. I'm going back now. Captain, maybe my advice wasn't so good. Why don't you wait a little while before you talk to her? I'll have to work this out my own way. Well, I hope you know what you're doing. Sparrow, I don't feel like playing tonight. That suits me fine. You must be tired. Why don't you get a good night's rest? I know we got a big day ahead of us tomorrow. I'll feel fresh as a daisy. Sparrow. Oh, yes, come to think of it. I am a bit tired. Good night. Good night. Come on, let's take a little walk down the beach. I want to talk to you. We can talk here. Oh, but you don't understand, John. I, I understand only one thing, John. I'm leaving you. Leaving me? Why? Ever since we've been here, I've been completely alone, except for Sparrow and you. Nobody ever comes near this place. You even do all your business by telephone. I thought you were happy here. I hate it here. We never go anywhere. We never see anybody. You never invite anyone to visit us. I can't stand it here any longer. Joan, we made a bargain. And... That's just it. I've kept my part of the bargain. You haven't. being married to you, John, that I mind. It's, it's this place. Are you sure it isn't your young doctor that you miss? At first, I thought that was the reason. But, oh, well, that's all over now. I gave Fred up when I came here. Oh, oh John, let's call off our bargain. You don't need me anymore. You're all right now. Oh, but I do need you. I've been so busy getting well that I didn't realize how lonely you've been until now. If we were to leave here, it'd make a difference, wouldn't it, Joan? Oh, maybe I, I... I don't know. Well, we'll leave here. We'll travel, Joan. We'll visit all the places you've ever wanted to go to. We'll do all the things that you've ever wanted to do. I promise you, you'll never be lonely again. I'll be able to straighten out my affairs in a few days, and I'll make all the arrangements. I love you, Joan. You've got to stay with me. From. How'd you get here? How long are you going to stay? <laughs> so fast, but I'm tired enough as it is. I've been walking for miles. How many one could find this place is beyond me. Exclusive, that's what we use. Exclusive. Wait till Joan sees you. Will she be surprised? You stay here. Just wait till Joan sees you. Joan? Oh, uh, Joan? Yes, Barrow? What is it? Guess who's here? Hello, Joan. Come from? How'd you get here? How long are you gonna stay? Well, you're as bad as Sparrow. Give me a chance to catch my breath. <laughs> I'll give you just two minutes, and then I'm gonna fire question after question at you. Oh, Fred, it's so good to see you. I'll see you later, Doc. Come on up. Clever idea, turning a lighthouse into a beach home. An expensive idea. Much further? 
What's the matter? Can't you take it? This is good exercise. Yeah. Come on. Oh, at last. It's lovely, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, it is. Not me, silly. The view. Oh, sure. That's all right, too. This is our solarium. On a clear day, you, you can, can see, see for miles, miles out to sea. sea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Fred, it's so wonderful to see you again. Did you miss me? Of course I did. You must have been lonely. A little. Who's the chess player? John. He's a master at it. He's been teaching me to play. How is he? Much better than when you last saw him. He's gone to the city for a few days. Joan, when you play chess with him, don't you get a feeling of being trapped? What do you mean? Oh, well, looking for a way out, not finding any. What makes you say that? I don't know. It's just a feeling I have that you're not really happy here. Joan, you know, it's still not too late. I tried staying angry with you, but I couldn't. Why don't you admit you made a mistake? Tell Sinclair you're coming back with me. Maybe I'm still selfish, Fred. But, Joan, I, I left the clinic. I have my own practice now. We can have all the things we've always wanted. Why didn't you tell me this before? Because of pride, I guess. And then I realized I needed you more than anything else. That's funny. If you'd told me this and asked me just a few days ago, I would have said yes. And why not now? Because John has fallen in love with me. You see, he made the same mistake I did. Now we're both in love with him. I guess the plans we made together don't mean anything more to you now. Oh, Fred, of course they do. Just, just give me a little more time. All right, Joan. It's going to be interesting to see what happens. But somehow or other, I'll make you see things my way. Hello, Joan. You up there? Well, hello, Fred. Well, this is a grand surprise. What's, uh, what's the matter with you two? Fred, this is terrific. It's grand to see you. Oh, I forgot. I'm sore at you. This is the first time you've shown up since we've been here. How do you think I look? Wonderful, John. You don't look so well, Fred. Does he, dear? Well, we'll have to fix that. You're going to stay right here with us until we close this place and move back to New York. Isn't he, darling? You promised to make up your mind today. I have. Well? I've been here now for six months. Shut away from the world. Away from life. Now I'm going to collect for every minute of that time. But we'll still be able to see a lot of each other. It'll work. Just you wait and see. Oh, nice. I'll just stick around, and every time Sinclair goes out the front, I'll sneak in through the back door. Stop it, Fred. You must try to understand. Nothing could ever possibly come between us. You know that. Oh, I do, Joan. We only disagree on one little thing. The only way I'll ever come in is through the front door. Remember that. Couldn't you wait just a little while longer? No. You see, I've changed. You once said I was soft. I, I let people push me around, and you were right. But not anymore. I tried to get you out of my mind. I, I know it's wrong to keep on loving you, but I can't help it. There's nothing I can do about it. But you're not going to ruin my life. You've had your chance. Now I'm going to do things my way. I'm afraid we're not being very good hosts. Joan has a bad headache, and I'm tired. Please don't apologize. After all, I barged in on you. Here's one of Sparrow's mystery books. How about that? Some people find them relaxing. 
thanks. I'll be ready for bed myself in an hour or so. You know, most people like those, but personally, I can't get interested in them. You always know the murderer's gonna get caught. Oh, of course. Murder's one thing nobody can get away with. Oh, I don't know about that. In real life, there are some unsolved murders. All it takes is the intelligence to work out a plan and then the nerve to carry it through. You think so? Oh, certainly. It's like a game of chess. Come over here. I'm well, supposing I had some good reason for wanting you out of the way. Here's how I'd go about murdering you. Oh, don't, don't look alarmed. Look at the board. <laughs> now, move number one, witnesses. I'd establish my alibi. How? Ah. Simple. i let it be known that you'd been walking in your sleep. I'd tell Sparrow. It'd get around the village. I'd say that I caught you halfway out of one of these solarium windows. Why not the bedroom window? Too narrow. A man couldn't get through it. Then I'd tell Sparrow... I'd throw your body through this window. At 4 a.m., the tide would carry your body out at sea. As far as the police were concerned, an unfortunate sleepwalker had met an accidental death. In chess, that's known as checkmate. You missed your calling. You'd make a master criminal. Well, it's a pretty good murder, if I do say so myself. Pretty good. It's clever. Oh, but there's something wrong with it. There's one thing missing. What's that? I have no motive, whatever, for murdering you. <laughs> <laughs> you going downstairs? Oh, don't forget your book. Uh, no, no, I, uh, I think I'll sit up here for a while and read. What did he mean by that game of chess? Is he planning to kill you or only trying to frighten you? Better leave here before it's too late. You've lost Joan, haven't you? Or is there something you can do about it? Evening, Fred. Oh, hello, Sparrow. Where are you off to? Well, I've got to do a bit of surf fishing. Nice night for it. Do you want to come along? No, thanks. Oh, Sparrow, uh, will you do me a favor? Anything you say. Thanks. Look, when you get down to the village tomorrow, will you uh, stop in the marine hardware store and uh, buy some locks? Tomorrow is Sunday, Doc. Sunday? Oh, yes, I've forgotten. Well, you can get them first thing on Monday. All right. Uh, what kind do you want? Let's see. Um, just locks for windows. How many do you need? Mmm, there's ten windows, so I need ten locks. What you need all those for? Nobody can get in through a lighthouse window. It's a steep drop. I'm not worried about anybody getting in. I'm worried about somebody falling out. Falling out? What you mean? I don't want to alarm you or Joan, Sparrow, but last night I caught John walking in his sleep. Walking in his sleep? Yeah, I heard someone moving around, so I got up to investigate. The noise seemed to come from the solarium. When I reached there, I saw him climbing out through one of the windows. I pulled him back just in time or he would have fallen and killed himself. Over-exercise, that's what it is. He's been taking things too strenuous. I'll get the locks as quickly as possible. Oh, Sparrow, don't mention this to Joan. She doesn't know anything about it and there's no need to worry her. Mum's the word. And whatever you do, don't say anything to John either. He doesn't realize what danger he was in. He didn't wake up till it was all over. No, I won't tell him. Funny I never knew. Good night, Doc. Night, Sparrow. Good morning. How you doing? Will you please fill this prescription for a sedative? It's for Mr. Sinclair. He's not sleeping well. You want it in tablets? No, I'd like to have it in powder form if you have it. Mr. Sinclair can't swallow pills. Here you are. You better tell him to be careful not to take an overdose. This is powerful stuff. I know. I'm a doctor. Everything's working perfectly, isn't it? Wasn't it thoughtful of Sinclair to tell you exactly how to murder him? You know John will sleep soundly when he drinks this. Coffee, John? Black, please. Thanks. Sorry I had to change your plans about leaving tomorrow. Uh, yes, I, I would have preferred staying until you closed the house and gone back with you and Joan. Well, maybe you won't go. Maybe you'll feel differently about it tomorrow.
Couldn't you possibly stay a little longer, Fred? No, uh, no, my work's piling up. I've, I've got to get back. It's been wonderful, your being with us. Yes. Yes, it has. Well, I think I'll take my coffee into the solarium. I'd like a farewell look at the view. Coming, John? I'll be with you in a minute. One grand fellow, Fred. You're gonna miss him, aren't you, darling? Coffee cold? Well, here, take mine. Mine's warmer. Uh, I guess I'll turn in now, dear. I I'm really exhausted. I'll have my coffee before I go to bed. Good night. Good night, darling. Fred every step in your scheme and he helped you carry it out. Who would suspect that a murdered man would collaborate in his murderer's alibi? Hurry, John, hurry. The coroner may be able to determine that Fred was dead before his body struck the rocks. won't open. This calls for a quick change of plans, doesn't it? Carry the body downstairs quickly and lay it on the rocks. Then you'll have time to come up later and open one of the windows. It's riskier than your first plan. But when you tell the police about walking in your sleep and finding that Fred had fallen out while trying to save you, maybe they won't examine the body too closely.
Sparrow. What are you doing here this time of night? I often go walking in the early morning. You know that. Something terrible has happened. Fred is... The doctor? Yes. I must have been walking in my sleep. I woke up halfway out of one of the solarium windows. Fred must have fallen out trying to pull me back. I saw him hit the rocks. It was horrible. You say he fell out of one of the windows in the solarium? Yes. That's impossible. Impossible? What do you mean? I couldn't buy locks on Sunday, John, so I nailed all the solarium windows shut today. All right, Sparrow. It didn't happen just the way I said. But it was an accident. Fred tried to kill me tonight so that John would be free to marry him. I can prove it. How? I suspected him and I rigged up a dummy and I put it in the bed. I can show you where he tried to kill me in my sleep. Show me, John. And if it's the truth, I'll stand by you. I'll show you. There's been a terrible accident. Fred fell from a window in the solarium. That's a lie. He didn't fall. I saw you carry his body down the stairs. You murdered him. But you don't understand. Fred tried to kill me. No, he didn't. You murdered him because you knew I loved him. Joan, let me explain. It won't do you any good. I've called the police. <laughs> Too late now, John. I guess you'll have to face it. Sparrow did what he could for his friend, but the jury didn't believe John Sinclair's story, and he paid the extreme penalty for the murder of Fred Graham. Joan inherited the Sinclair millions and went away to the life of luxury she had always craved. But constantly haunting her was the tragedy that cost the lives of the man she loved and the man she married. She traveled from city to city seeking forgetfulness, but there was no escape from the past. She came back at last to live out a life of torment in the solitude and desolation of the lighthouse. I know, because I am the whistler. <laughs>